Hey, what's going on, everyone? Before we get into our conversation, I want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by BetRivers.com. BetRivers.com, the best place for all your sports gambling needs. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch all of these episodes on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Now, let's get into our conversation. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Eric Devendorf, your host of the Scores Table Podcast. And today we have on another great guest. This next guest was born in Detroit, Michigan, where he was a high school from 1996 to 2002 with Detroit Central and Detroit Crockett. Then he went on to Kent State University, where he was assistant for two years, eventually going to Syracuse, where he was assistant for seven years, and then went to Eastern Michigan and took over his own program, where he was the head coach for 10 years. And now he currently is the president and general manager of the Motor City Crews and senior director of player personnel for the Detroit Press. Detroit Pistons, my guy, Rob Murphy. Murph, appreciate you coming on, man, taking the time. Uh, thanks for having me, E. I appreciate it. It's always good to catch up with family and, and folks that we've been knowing for, for many, many years. So, again, I always uh, enjoy talking to you, enjoy what you're doing in the Syracuse community. So whenever I can uh, come on and, and reminisce and talk and share, uh, I'm always for it. So I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Appreciate it. And, and I forgot to mention you got your own foundation and also um, wrote a great book called Deep about your life. And we'll we'll get into that. But let's first let's start off with just growing up in Detroit, man, because I know we had you on the show uh, with me and Chris Joe and you kind of talked about, uh, you know, some of the adversities growing up. So just let's start back home in Detroit and tell me about growing up and, and how that was. Well, you know, it was it was rough. Obviously, I come from from challenging times and challenging situations. He, um but I, I believe all the challenges and the situations that I went through uh, kind of molded me into the person I am today. And as I look back, learned a lot of lessons, good and bad, as I was growing up. So I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, but just, you know, in a nutshell, uh, growing up in, in the inner city is always tough. You know, Brewster Projects, uh, Dexter Linwood in, in the inner city of Detroit is, is a really tough area. Um, and then on the, the Seven Mile and Livinois area. Um, so just having an upbringing, um, a lot of challenges. And then unfortunately for me, I didn't have a, a father figure in my life. You know, I come from a single parent home uh, where I was being raised early on by my mother and grandmother, uh, and then maybe a few uncles. Um, and then from there, my mom's life was tragically taken uh, when I was at the age of 13 in a murder. Um, so that kind of changed my life forever. So it made it even tougher um, to already grow up in struggle and in tough situations uh, and then to have that experience not knowing where I will be living next, who will be my legal guardian next. Um, that was a, that was a, a big challenge for me. Uh, and we talk about like mental health in today's world and it's a big topic of what people go through and, and, and who you should talk to, whether you should seek counseling or share what you may be going through for the young kids and adults today. Uh, but back then it was more so like whatever you were going through, you just kept it to yourself. You had to suck it up and figure it out. Um, it wasn't these open platforms or even these situations where counseling was available. I can remember when my mother was killed, I missed school for maybe a week. I moved in with a, 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 the Cottrell family um, who on my father's side was some folks that um, I knew and was familiar with that I had a relationship with. Um, but I can remember moving in with them missing school for about a week. And I went back to school and not a teacher, a counselor or a principal even had one talk with me about what happened with my mom, right? So now I'm going through these times in middle school. I can remember being in high school and not having a parent there to watch me play football and basketball. So everything I was doing in a positive manner, trying to do the right things, I really had no support. And it's nothing like your mom and dad, as you know, because you come from a great family and I was able to get to know them through the recruitment process and build a relationship with them. But you know how important those figures were, whether you understood it when you were young or not, you look back and you really understand the support they gave you. But just going through now, when I look back at the, the, the depression that I was going through that I never knew, um, that everything that I had built up inside me that I could never let out, uh, whether it was embarrassment or not being confident enough to tell it. So you just put your head down and you keep moving. And those are, are some of the things that I went through that when I got to the point of being a head coach after leaving Syracuse and starting my foundation, uh, all of these experiences, when I thought back, encouraged me to write my book and tell my story because I know it was a, I know it's a lot of people that have 
you know, went through what I went through then are going through it now. And I just wanted to be someone that can encourage you, um, tell you, t tell my story to let you know your, your circumstances and the obstacles don't have to dictate your outcome. That's the biggest message I wanted to get across. Um, so that's a little bit in a nutshell, you know, the challenges and the upbringing, but I also had a lot of angels in my life. E at the time, it was my little league coach, Greg Cannon, my high school coach, Vanessa Jordan, my college coach, Kevin Porter. There were always some coach, which I believe, which also got me into coaching and mentoring, because without those coaches growing up, especially here in Detroit, giving me some guidance, uh, I don't know if I would ever have made it out or be where I am today. Yeah, that's kind of leading me into my next question. Who kind of led you into playing ball, playing football? Because we know you as a coach, but you you played college ball as well at Central State. So who was kind of that first person to, I guess, put the ball in your hands and get, get yeah, well, you? Yeah, well, I always had a love for, for sports. Um, I played football, basketball, and baseball, actually, when I was eight and nine years old in the PAL League. Um, Donald Chance that lived on the street was our little league baseball coach. So he always was the one encouraging us to play sports. So I started off playing ba baseball and football. And Greg Cannon is a guy I just mentioned who was my little league coach, uh, encouraged me to play football. You know, I was always fast. I was really athletic. Um, and I fell in love with, with the sport of football. Um, thought I would be a football player, all city, all state in high school. Um, and then that's when I met Vanessa Jordan, who was my high school basketball coach. For whatever reason, I loved basketball, but I was really good in football. All city, all state, but really had no interest, just was doing it off talent. Um, so when Vanessa Jordan came into my life as my a high school coach at Montford High School, um, I remember my 11th grade year, he, he told me, you know, you're not a good, you're not a pro. You got to figure out what you're going to do in life. You're a leader. Your biggest issue is you lead all the athletes, but you lead all the gang members too. So you're part of all, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm hanging with the wrong guys, but I'm still an athlete. So I'm down with the athletes too. So he could see how I was a leader and I communicated well and I, I was able to get people to buy in and to follow. So he told me that the, your biggest problem is you're leading the wrong people, right? You need to continue to enhance your skills. Uh, next year, we'll figure out where you're going to go to college because you're not going to be a pro. But if you major in education, I'll save my job here at Mumford High School and you can come back here and start teaching and coaching and giving back to the community. So being the coachable person I am, I'm always listening. And I thought that made sense because I love basketball. I was a point guard. I understood the game. I was a captain. So then when I started looking at colleges, I made sure that I could go somewhere that where I can major in education and come back to be a teacher and a coach. So I give a lot of credit to my high school basketball coach, but he gave me, because he gave me that vision and direction. Sometimes we're out here and we're trying to figure it out as kids, uh, and we don't know if we don't have those mentors in our life. But when somebody can give you vision and direction, uh, and it's something that you can relate to and really understand, uh, it can bode well for you for the rest of your life. So I took that advice, uh, attended Central State University Division II school, wasn't a great player, uh, but my whole goal was to go to college, get my education, major in education, uh, and follow the plan out that Venus Jordan had laid out to me. So that's what I did by attending Central State, majored in education, graduated, came back to Detroit and started teaching and coaching. So you said you said you weren't you weren't a great player, but I mean your last two years at Central State, you were team captain, right? Yeah, I was team captain. Uh, I always made my mark being the best defender on the floor, right? Wasn't a great shooter. Like, it wasn't, we, we didn't even shoot a lot of threes back then. The game has evolved and changed so much. But I knew, they used to call me, my nickname in high school was Hustling Rob. Like, so for 50-50 balls, I was going to come up with them. I was yeah. going to steals. I was going <laughs> to dab on the floor. I was going to slide my feet. I was going to take charges. I was going to do everything to impact the game without scoring. Right. So that's what I did. Hustling rock, the hustling rock, hustle, do, do whatever you need to do to keep yourself on the floor. So that was, you know, pretty much, you know, my mentality. And then I took my game on the Central State and I continued to pride myself on just working extremely hard, uh, making sure you play really good defense. But more important, being a leader, being a point guard, making sure guys was in the right position, motivating guys to work on their game and get better. Uh, and just continue to improve my game as much as I can. And I was always a coach on the floor, whether I was playing or not. I was always the guy leading the locker room and encouraging guys to do what they needed to do.
Let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their new Rush Pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, more secure, and more reliable. With basketball season right around the corner, there's never been a better time to get in on the action by going to betrivers.com. Today or downloading the Bet Rivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call telephone number 1-800-GAMBLER. Yeah, one, one of them dudes on defense where you just like a, a gnat just running around. The dudes yeah. that you hate to play against, for yeah. real. Yeah, guys throwing elbows at you like, man, give me a break. Like, like, like <laughs> yeah. we would come out, guys would be at the free throw line and I'm going standing next to my man. They coming out the huddle and I'm denying them. And I'm, man, I was like one of those guys that was <laughs> yeah. irritating that you hated. But for me, I was going to get on your nerves. I was going to get in your head. You know, you know the talking game, right? So, because you would do it. You would love to talk. Talk and back it up. So I would tell guys like, you know, I would walk on the floor and I always guarded the leading scorer, especially if it was one through or one, two or three. And we step out on the floor and I would just look a guy in his eye and say, you know, you're done today. What? Yeah, you're done today. Like you don't even worry about doing nothing. You averaging 18, 19, <laughs> you're going to leave here with maybe four or five today. Like true story. I would always do that. Uh, and that was the best part of my game. And I always felt if a guy came in averaging 20, if I could have held him to six or eight, I wasn't scoring, but I wasn't allowing him to score. So it was impacting the game and helping my team or putting our, our, our team in position to win. So, yeah, I was that defensive guy. And I took that on, you know, as far as my playing career. But when I became a coach, I was the same way. I was, like, really making sure that guys understood how important the defensive side of the ball is. You come, you, so you come back to Detroit, you, you say you get into teaching and coaching, but you get the opportunity to be a head coach at Detroit Central, uh, where you coach Tone Gates and then later uh, Detroit Crockett. So you talked about your mentality on the court, like when you was playing. How did you do that? How did you incorporate that mentality to those players? You know what I mean? How, how were you able to get that across to them? Because that's not as easy as a lot of people think. Yeah, just uh, just helping them understand because everybody goes in the gym when you're working on your game. And when you talk in basketball, the most important thing in everybody eyes is offense. Can you shoot? Can you dribble? Can you score? Um, so everybody does that. But when it comes to basketball in a unified game, you have to get stops to, to win the game. So me, my mentality was always as a coach in the last four minutes, no matter what the game was, we had to get stops. We had to get kills. That was we would call a kill like you get three stops and you score three times. So if you can do that uh, probably six to eight times a game and go on six or runs in different spurts of the game, when you look up at, at the end of the game, you don't went on a 24-0 run and somehow you've won by probably 10 to 12 points, right? So just making guys understand, like if you slide your feet and you can cut your man off, you put your man in position to get a steal. If you get a steal, you score in transition. I would always encourage guys, if you want to get dunks, you want to have highlight plays, get a deflection, leads to a steal, leads to a transition bucket. So that was always my sell. We want to run, but we got to run off our defense. We want to get easy buckets, we got to do it with our defense. And when you teach it and preach it that way and give them examples and show them film, deflection, steal, dunk, guys would be more, more motivated to slide their feet and make it a way that easier to get to the, uh, the other end quickly to maybe get a dunk or a highlight fly. So how, how did you guys start uh, the Michigan Hurricanes? Because you you talked about it at, on our other show with Chris Joe. I said it again. You were one of the co-founders. How did that all come together? Man, it's, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, it was the it was the Michigan Mustangs at one time. Yeah, at first, right, Michigan yeah, Mustangs. At first, Michigan Mustangs. And so I was at Crockett High School at the time. Good friend of mine, Rareddy Murray, was at uh, Southeastern High School. So I remember Chris Greer had a rift with uh, Norm at the time, who was the AU coach. They were partners. So Chris came to my house one weekend, and we were just sitting on the couch talking. And he was saying, man, I'm trying to get Norm to let me do this, let me do that. 
So I remember saying to Greer, I said, Greer, why don't you go to Sonny? Let's just think about this. You already have like Anthony Robeson and Matt Trainer. We have Maurice Ager, Brandon Jenkins, Walter Waters. Why don't you go to Sonny for Carroll and talk to him and we just create a, 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 a different team? And he's like, hmm, I didn't think about that. I don't know if I'm able to do that. But you know what? I'm, that's a good idea. He called Sonny that week, told him the players we had and what we were thinking about doing. Two weeks later, we came up with the name, the Michigan Hurricanes. He was back at my house. Uh, his brother at the time, Nick, who went on to play in the NFL, but he played for the Miami Hurricanes football. He was a really yeah. good player. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where the hurricane name came from because his brother was uh -huh. playing for the Miami Hurricanes at the time. So we just said we were going to be the Michigan Hurricanes. We took the idea of the Sonny McCarroll. He bought into it. We got Maurice Aker, Brandon Jenkins, Walt Waters, Deion Harris, Anthony Robeson, Matt Trennan, Olu Femmetin. And then we put all of that together and we were one of the top teams in the country the following year. So then we had a great first year. Then the next year, um, we added LeBron James for a few tournaments and we just started yeah. getting other guys to play with our AAU team. So I was a high school coach, co-founder of the AAU team and traveling all summer. And that was like a huge, huge, huge part of my career uh, because we, we called it the Up and Smoke Tour at the time. We had put it together and, uh, <laughs> and we were just having a ball, man, just going around the country, playing in these different AAU tournaments, winning some big tournaments, but more importantly, uh, just continuing to grow the brand, uh, grow the AAU team, continue to get guys in college, get them scholarships and push them toward their ultimate goal. So it was like a, a great feeder system for what we were trying to do and, and one of my biggest feats uh, throughout my career. A lot of dudes went to college for free out of that program. I yeah. know that for sure. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No That's question. Right. Being, being you coming along too, because um, I can remember when they were trying to recruit you. Now, I was on at Kent State at that time, but they kept saying, man, we got to get this kid Eric Thievendorf. And somehow you ended up at a family practice. And I remember them calling me like, man, the family, they done stole our guy. So Will <laughs> called me, <laughs> Chris Beer called me. And I'm like, well, you need me to call him as a college coach? What y'all need me to do? He's like, no, we about to go up there. We're going to talk to his parents. We got to get him. And then two days later, they said, no, he down with us. And the rest was history. And you was a Michigan Hurricane. But I, I remember that process of your recruitment while I was at Kent State. So look, Merck, this, this is how, how I jumped off, though. Like, it was my ninth grade year. And we were playing at, I was at Bay City Central. We were playing at Flint Northwestern. This is when Olu had, it probably was a, I think Olu might have been a junior, I think. Yeah. He was, you know, McDonald's, whatever. And this is when Kelvin Tober was at Michigan State. His freshman. Yeah, it was going. It was Olu's team now. Yeah, yeah it was. Gotcha. Okay. And they yeah. had, like, I think a guard like Eric Price, a little guard yeah. like Eric. Yeah. So I went in there freshman year. This probably was, like, my fourth game on varsity. I went in there, had, like, 35. And I remember Greer, you know, Greer was in there. And then after the game, I remember him coming up and saying something to me, like, hey, you know, you being just something real quick, like, hey, we're interested in playing AAU. Boom. So after that, I remember going back home and then Marshall Thomas from Saginaw High, you know, comes up to me and says, you know, we want you to play for the family because he would Nike. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. That's right. So, you know, yeah. So that's how I end up going with Joe Crawford and Malik and, and practicing with them. But that was just like a that was just like a one day thing. And then I ended up going with with the Hurricanes. But it all started with that game. I gave, I gave Olu 35. I, I hold it hold it over his head to this day. <laughs> yeah, that was your basically your coming out party. And then I remember Marshall Thomas, they were telling me that they should have got you to try to come to Saginaw, too, at that time. But they were yeah. sleeping, didn't know who you were, how good you were, but it was talks that they was going to try to get you to transfer. Um, tell me, and I remember the Oak Hill transfer, but what went into that and why did you do that? So like you said, I was I was actually gonna go to Arthur Hill mm -hmm. at first. I was because my grandma lived in Saginaw, and she wow. lived probably like three minutes from Arthur Hill. So I was just gonna go live with her, and and use that address, go there, and then Saginaw High. They was they were talking about it, but it wasn't. You know, I was never gonna go to Saginaw. It would have been Arthur Hill. So it was probably my junior year when I was at Bay City Central. It was at that time, man. It was just like. I started to get in trouble a little bit as far as like, you know, you start, you start to kind of have a big, a big fish in a, or a small pond type of thing going on in Bay city, just doing dumb stuff, probably not going to class grades was kind of slipping. 
So that's when Will, you know, Will was like, all right, we got we to gotta get him up out of there. Bob yeah. Gibbons, I remember Oak Hill came and watched me play down there in North Carolina at Duke. After that game, Coach Will, I remember him telling me, he's like, whatever you want to do, you, if you want to go, you you could go. That's, they just came and watched you play. And after that, just seeing the history, I remember I didn't know anything about Oak Hill, but once I started looking it up and, you know, you know, yeah. Ron Mercer, Rod Strickland, all those guys, Jerry Sackhouse, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's – that's yeah, where I'm gonna go. Yeah, no brainer. And and yeah. Murph, first time I go there, my parents take me. I go in, I walk in the gym. I, it's a six eleven dude in there shooting, handling that thing from yeah. deep. Yeah. You know, a little I know it's that's one of the greatest you know basketball players of all time, Kevin Durant. So that whole like experience from you know just from getting seen at in, in Duke to you know going to play in that first open gym that was like that changed my whole basketball you know, my whole basketball journey. Yeah, and I can remember, too, you had committed to Syracuse. You were at Oak Hill your senior year, and I can remember because you guys had the pay phone, right, in the in the hall. Y'all had the pay phone, and I would call <laughs> you on that pay phone. I'll never forget it. And I would ask you, I would say, E, is Kevin Durant going straight to the pros? You would be like, I'm going to be honest with you, Mark. Like, you ain't going to better get him. He going straight to the pros. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to recruit this dude for a minute. So I'm recruiting and getting to know his mom, Wanda, and all his people. And then I would call you. You'd be like, and I would, we remember me and Bayham coming there. And I was asking you then, E, what's up? With, like, what you think? Murphy going to the pros. Okay, cool. I stopped recruiting Kevin Durant. Had a relationship with him. Had a relationship with his mom. All of a sudden, <laughs> at the end of the year, they put the rule in where guys couldn't go out of high school. Yeah. Texas, Russell Springman had been in there all year recruiting them. Didn't know this rule was going to happen, but was recruiting them. And I remember that's why he went to Texas. They had built a relationship with him. And I said to myself, I let Eric discourage me from recruiting <laughs> this kid because he said he was going pro. But I'll never forget that, though. That was some fun times. You guys had a hell of a team. I can remember going to watch you guys. I forget where it was, but you was playing against Lou Williams and the other guard. When they were yeah, in high Mike school. Mike Mercer. Ron Mercer, that's exactly Mike right. Mike Mercer. Mike Mercer. Yeah, Mike went to Mercer, Georgia. Mike Mercer. Yep. Yeah. You hit them two guards, and it was you, KD, and y'all whole team battling. Y'all end up winning. And I can remember Kevin didn't play well. Nah, we lost, Murph. We lost. Though, though that was one of the two games we lost. We lost to Julian Wright's team, and then we lost to Lewis Williams and Mike Mercer team because KD didn't sense. play well. Okay, well, that makes sense because I remember when I when Kevin, when you guys came out that locker room. Kevin Durant's mom. Yeah. Woo! That scene there. Yeah. And I tell people, I look back at all of those times and say, y'all don't understand. She was going to make sure he was going to be great. He was destined to be great because he was talented. He was a good player. He had all the skills and the tools. But what his mother would do before and after games was, like, unbelievable. And don't let him play well and lose. It was going to be a problem. But I remember being there and watching you guys and watching your journey, and you were committed to us. And, man, those were some fun times when you look back, like really, really fun experiences when I look back. And I never really live in the moment, but when I go back and think about it, I just think about all those enjoyable times. Yeah, that that just being able to play with those type of guys. We had Ty Lawson. Shit, Ty Lawson got drafted, uh, I don't know, six or something. Man, my yeah. man was, you know, he was one of the fastest dudes. Wow. With the ball in his hands, like Johnny Flynn, the, the Johnny Flynn before I really seen Johnny Flynn. You yeah. know what I mean? Like he no was. Quite. No, Ty was, was good. You guys had a squad. And then KD ended up leaving at when you left. And then Michael Beasley and that whole crew went down there as well. Um, but yeah, but that that was that was good times. I'm glad you brought up the high school career to Oak Hill, because that just brings back so many great memories, man. Yeah, that was on that hill, man. That was, and you know, it was in the middle. Of, that was a two-hour drive from, from yeah. the airport. Man, weaving in the car with Jim Beheim at night, <laughs> trying to make sure we were safe with no navigation. Because it was like this, Murph. Yeah, yeah, going up and then going back. It was kind of better because you would be going down. But that yeah. was the time before it was navigation. You can type in MapQuest and put in the directions and try to follow. But it yeah. wasn't no putting it on your phone. <laughs> Open it on your navigation, and I would be in the car with coach. Like, okay, I got a Hall of Fame coach. This is my first year working at Syracuse. I can't mess nothing up. I got to be on time. I got to make sure this guy's safe. <laughs> I got an icon in my car. 
Like I was still in awe that I was working at Syracuse and working for Coach Bayheim. But those trips uh, were so meaningful because I would get to know him. We would go see the guys we were recruiting and we would have a lot of fun, especially in my early years. Um, it's always exciting when you're taking on a new challenge and meeting new people and learning stuff new. Uh, but those were some some incredible times during those recruiting times. So I want to I want to take it back to Kent State when you were you were there for two years and you coached Antonio Gates. You were able to coach him in high school. I mean, I know you and right. you and Tone are, uh, you know, super good relationship. So you coached him in high school at Detroit Central, and then you coached him at Kent State. But did you ever see him becoming a Hall of Fame tight end like that? That's <laughs> that you right know, there is crazy. It, it it's amazing. Because when he was in high school, I remember Antonio was playing football and a lot like myself, we had another kid named Dwight Smith on the team. Both of them were on the team. And I told Dwight and Antonio, I said, I, I, I don't want to say I made a mistake because I wouldn't be standing in front of you guys here today. But my best sport was football. And I believe if I would have put my all in the football, I could have made it to the NFL. I was all city, all state. I just didn't have a love for it. <clears throat> I shared that with Dwight and Antonio the white took the advice right away, played at Central. He went on uh, to Akron, and then he was the first round, the second round draft choice out of Akron. But he 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 really put basketball to the side. Well, Antonio, like myself, was in love with foot. I mean, basketball. He just wanted to play basketball, and he was dominating in basketball. Obviously, winning the state championship at Central was one thing, but I can remember him on the AAU circuit playing for the Michigan Mur uh, Mustangs, and. At that point, he was playing against like the Tracy McGrady's of the world. And he would go to Vegas and they won the big time and he would dominate all the top players. So in his mind, he felt he wanted to play basketball and go to the NBA. Long story short, through his recruitment, he didn't get recruited at a high level in basketball. He had a few Mac offers, but at the time, Nick Saban, uh, was the football coach at Michigan State. So I remember Nick Saban come to Central with his staff telling us, that if Antonio came to Michigan State and played football after two or three years, he would be a professional football player. He had all the attributes to be a great player. He was athletic, had great hands. He can play offense or defense. I remember one time Antonio in high school scored six touchdowns, four as a receiver, uh, two on the defensive end, intercepted the ball, ran it in for a touchdown, and sacked the quarterback, picked up the ball, and ran it in for a touchdown. So he was highly recruited as a football player on offense and defense, Florida, Florida State, Miami, LSU, Michigan, Michigan Dang. State. He was like unbelievable. He, so he didn't have the grades, right? So he had to go to Michigan State as a prop 48. So he went to Michigan State. We believed in what Nick Saban said. I mean, he was a great football player. So he'd go up there and he still had a love for basketball. So opposed to doing what he's supposed to do basketball-wise, he's hanging out with the team, please. He's trying to figure out how he can walk on the basketball team, right? And I can remember Tom Izzo. We talked to Tom Izzo. He like, man, I would take him, but I gotta, you know, I gotta talk to Nick, Nick Saban, Coach Saban. He called Nick Saban, and whatever Nick Saban said, Coach Izzo shut it down. So no chance he was gonna play basketball at, at Michigan State. So Antonio got frustrated with the situation transfer to Eastern Michigan. He said, you know what? I'm just going to transfer to Eastern Michigan because he was so in love with basketball. Transfer to Eastern Michigan, stay there a year, don't work out, go to junior college, end up graduating and coming to Kent State. I can remember his senior year. Um, he still was talking about he wanted to play basketball. I'm like Antonio. I remember sitting him down in the office at Kent State and we made a deal. He was going to Portsmouth. I said, Antonio, if you go to Portsmouth and you don't come back as one of the top two players out of this camp, you got to give football a try. He was like, okay, bet. I'll make a deal with you. If that happens, if I'm not the top two players in Portsmouth, I'm going to come back and I'm going to pursue football. He didn't know, but a month prior to that, during the basketball season, his senior year, me and uh, Rob Sinderoff, who was a, another assistant coach at Kent, we got together, put together a letter. We sent it out to 30 NFL teams with his profile, why he had attended Michigan State. And after the season, we felt they should come in and take a look at him in a workout. So that letter went out to all the NFL teams. I made this deal with Antonio. I knew he wasn't gonna come back as one of the top two players in sports. <laughs> yeah. right? I already knew that. I knew how good he was, but I know how the, the game is played at Portsmouth. It's a dominated camp by guards, right? That are trying to yeah. make it to the league. 
So he comes back, not one of the top two players. So I said, Tom, I sat him down. I said, okay, you made this deal. I said, but this is what we did a month ago. I explained to him the letter we sent out and teams start calling. So I was acting as his agent. We set it up. I think six teams came in to see him work out at Kent State. We set it up. We went over and talked to the football coaches. They let us use the football indoor practice facility. So six teams came into Kent State to watch him work out on sort of like a pro day. And, and just all off this letter we had sent out. Well, he went in and worked out. He caught the ball for about, when he got one of the uh, Kent State quarterbacks, he caught the, the football for about, I would say 20 to 30 minutes, just running different routes, doing what the, the guys wanted to see him do. And I, I don't forget, after that workout, five teams left, one team stayed. It was a guy named Tim Brewster, who was the, at the time, the tight, end, tight ends coach for the San Diego Chargers. And he asked me, did Antonio have an agent? I said, no, I'm kind of running this process. You know, we don't know how this is going to work out, but I think he can, you know, play in the NFL. He said, well, can I take you guys to dinner tonight? So we went to dinner that night in Kent. I said, Antonio, you got to go with me. This tight ends coach want to meet you. So we at the dinner talking. He talking football with Antonio, getting to know him. So after the dinner, Antonio leaves. He said, listen, he understands football. I've seen everything I needed to see today. If you get him to sign with us, the San Diego Chargers, I promise you he'll be a pro bowler in three years. So I'm like, I'm looking like, is this a recruiting <laughs> thing? Like, are you serious? Like, I, you know, some guys get to talking and trying to like, just recruit you. And so I said, uh, no, you got to kind of tell me what that looks like. So he, you know, broke it down what his thoughts were, why he could be a great football player. Um, I said, well, you guys should just draft him. Should you got seven rounds, take him in the seventh round. He's like, no, we can't do that because we don't have no film on him. But you got to, you know, take my word. So I said, okay. So he flew back in two weeks later to watch Antonio work out again. That's how serious he was. Draft come, we sit through the draft. And San Diego called, Pittsburgh called, San Francisco 49ers called, the New York Giants called. Antonio wanted to side with Pittsburgh. We in the Kent State office. Tim Brewster called me and said, listen, I guarantee you he's going to be on the practice squad. If you just let him sign with us, and in three years, he's going to be a pro bowler. Don't forget what we talked about. So we looked at the contract. I said, Antonio, you got to guarantee $220,000 for two years if you sign with the Chargers. You're talking about you want to go overseas and play basketball. You're probably going to make seventy five dollars to $100,000 to start. You're going to be in another country. I don't know how you'll you know, do over there. You've never really been anywhere by yourself. I want to take this route and just sign with the Chargers to see if it can work out. $440,000 in two years, like you have no money right now, right? right. You <laughs> give it a shot. We yeah. signed a contract from Kent State office. We faxed it back. I still have the same, I still have his contract, the same contract that he signed. I still have That's it. That's legendary. Yeah, yeah. So we sign it. And before you know it, he's a, a in, 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 in summer camp, he's busting his butt. I'm calling and keeping in touch with the tight ends coach. He's like, don't tell him, but he's doing a really good job. I want to keep him hungry. So guys were getting cut left and right. I remember Antonio calling me, said, man, my roommate, I woke up and he was gone. Like, am I good? I'm like, no, you ain't good. Like, you might get cut tomorrow. You better work your butt off, right? So long story short, he made the team first four games. He's on the practice squad. And then he made it to the uh, special teams teams. Steven Alexander got hurt like six games in, who was a pro bowl tight end. Yeah. Antonio took his job and was a starter for 16 years in the NFL. He was a pro bowler in the second year. So, I mean, he was just a natural football player. He had all the gifts. He was tough, could run, catch, um, had speed, agility, um, really understood the game, like really smart player too, had good size for the position. And he transcended the tight end position. But that's kind of his story. And uh, he went out there and it made 16 years out of it. Now he's going into the Hall of Fame, probably be a first ballot Hall of Fame. Oh, no question, first ballot. He, he was best tight end in the league for most of his career, for real. Yeah, yeah. Well, I say he played 16 years for probably 10 of those years, which is really hard to do. He dominated that position. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, he's, he's good. He was on Dancing with the Stars last night. Uh, I forgot to, <laughs> forgot to watch it. So now he's into... Still works for the Chargers as a brand ambassador, still doing 
other things as he's continued to grow his different business, but, but really doing well. But it goes back to, and again, I'm all about making an impact, encouraging guys to do what they want to do and follow their dreams, but also try to give them advice and, and what they should do from my vantage point, you know, experience in life and what I can give back. So I'm, I'm sure he's forever thankful, but I'm forever thankful that he listened, that we were forward thinking while we were at Kent State and sending that letter and the teams coming out to watch him work out. It, it just was a life changer. Um, but as a coach and as a mentor, you're always thinking, especially at that age with the guys you're coaching, what's best for them and what can you do to put them in position to be the best for the rest of their life? That's all I've ever kind of been about when I got into this game because I know what all the coaches did for me. I talked about it at the beginning of this this, this uh, show um, and how impactful they were for me. So when I got into coaching and became a mentor, I wanted to have that same impact for young guys that I was touching when I was touching their lives. So I was able to do that for hundreds of guys throughout my career and really proud of that. And, and let's talk about it, you know, going from Kansas State to Syracuse, you spent seven years at Syracuse and you talked about impacting a lot of guys. You impacted a lot of guys, I mean, including myself, and I was uh, your first recruit, me and AO. You know, talk about, you know, how you got to Syracuse and then, you know, those seven those seven years at Syracuse, the relationships you built and the times you had. Yeah, so, I, you know, I had Syracuse, again, I always talk about the angels. I tell guys, whether it's man, male, female, always communicate, always build relationships. You never know who's watching. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know, uh, especially in today's world. Um, so I, I can just remember uh, it being uh, late June. Uh, I was sitting in my office and I had a Nextel phone and there was an incoming call and it came in and it was, I usually don't answer private calls. You know how we are, we get skeptical, right? Like who's calling me block? Like what is going on with this? Well, some told me to flip the Nextel and I said, hello, and it was Troy Weaver. Um, and that was on a Sunday. I happened to be in the office on a Sunday and he asked me, did I have an interest in coming to Syracuse? And I thought he was talking about the work camp. During that time, college coaches would go work camp. So, you know, I grew up loving Syracuse, as, as everybody knows. So I'm saying, yeah, I mean, to work camp. He said, no, to work here. I'm leaving to go to the NBA and take an NBA job in maybe three or four days. Coach Bayham is looking for a young assistant um, to keep the energy going, to continue to help him keep this great tradition and history going. Um, and I think you one of the top young guys out there. So, you know, I'm holding the phone like I know he's not serious. Like, this can't be serious. I got a chance to go to Syracuse? Like, there's no chance. So, um, long story short, he said, I'm going to have Coach Beheim call your boss in the morning, which was, was going to be Monday morning. He called Jim Christian. He called me and told me Troy would, you know, take care of my travel and I was going to come to interview uh, that Thursday. So this was Monday, so I had a few days. So I'm saying to myself, like, I'm calling Troy every day. Like, are you like, what can I do not to mess this up? <laughs> do I need to wear a tie? How should I dress? Like, do I need to bring a booklet? Like, what do I need to set up to make sure I get this job? He's like, no, Coach Bayham is not like that. He's a real down to earth guy. Uh, he'll come in and talk to you. And as long as you don't blow it, it's a great chance you'll get the job. I'm like, damn, but what can I do to blow it? Like, I don't want to, you know, so I'll get to Syracuse and, and I'd sit down and talk to coach. We have a great conversation. Uh, I was there all the 45 minutes and he said, welcome to Syracuse. So I'm like, okay, I've been, I've been in Manly Fieldhouse in this man's office. I'm looking at all these trophies, all these pictures. I'm sitting in front of an icon, one of my idols, a guy that I grew up just loving and watching and, 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 and like just trying to like, emulate from afar and in 45 minutes he says welcome to Syracuse so I'm thinking in my mind is he saying welcome to Syracuse because I'm here on an interview like welcome to the city or welcome <laughs> yeah. to Syracuse like you're hired right, right? So I, I, I walk out and you know Troy's like well how they go I'm like it's good and then my next interview was with Jay Croppenwell who was the AD there before Daryl Gross and he said oh well, we're glad to have you so in my mind I'm like wow, I'm, I'm really, I'm at Syracuse. I've been hired at Syracuse University. So I was excited, obviously, Troy and Hop and everybody, you know, were taking me around, meeting different people, uh, you know, within the university, um, within the team, within the community, mainly Troy Weaver. But then I asked Troy the next day, because I didn't want to ask him 
said, well, I, I had to, I have to ask you this. What made you call me? You know, a lot of people, we're not great friends. I got to know you through recruitment of when he started the recruitment process with you. He was recruiting Chris Douglas Roberts. And anytime he would come to Michigan, he would call me and kind of seek out information, whether I was affiliated with the player or not, because I knew everybody and had great relationships. And he said, no, I asked, I asked three people about you. I knew you from afar, but I asked three people about you. And all three people gave you great recommendations. They had great things to say about you. And they told me that you would be a great hire for Syracuse. And he told me who the three people were. So I said to myself, if one of those people say one bad thing about me, Troy may go in a different direction. So I always encourage people to know, like, life is no rehearsal. The camera is always rolling. Everybody is always watching. You never know who's watching you. You never know what they're watching you for. So always do your job at a high level. Always carry yourself professionally and make sure you put yourself in position for somebody to always want to talk to you again and always want to help you. I'm in the, in the business of, of like building relationships. And because Troy thought highly of me to even think enough to call me, and then the three people who he talked to said great things about me, put me in position to get hired at Syracuse by Coach Bayhound, which I'm forever thankful for because it changed my life. I went to Syracuse as, I would say, a young coach and really a boy. Um, but when I left, I was married. I had two children. Uh, so a lot of things happened to me when I, or for me in, in a very positive manner. And I grew up as a man and had a family while I was in Syracuse. So it will forever be a, a special place in my heart. What would you say your, your greatest moment on court uh, as a coach at Syracuse would be? Greatest moment on court? It always goes back to that that six overtime game. E. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can't it, it, I can't even explain what we were going through and and again to to win the game, right? I remember walking to the press conference with coach, and he said, Whew, "I'm just glad we're on the winning side, right? <laughs> right? Like because to lose the game, you will never know what that feels like and be a part of. But we were on the winning side of history and doing something great." And it was such an emotional up and down roller coaster, even in regulation. Like at that time, like people talk about Syracuse and the ACC, but the Big East was stacked with great stacked. programs and pros, right? So Connecticut had pros, Georgetown had pros, Villanova had pros. Like it was a pro almost on every team in the Big East at that time. So it was battles. So that UConn epic battle the emotional roller coaster of being going up and down and up and down and up and down and thought we won on your shot and then we go into overtime and then they take the lead by five and then we come back and take the lead and for <laughs> us to like like really hang in there and methodically sub and continue to coach through it and motivate through it and and want to win the game at no point no one wanted to lose that's why I went to six overtimes but that was a great feat in my most memorable moment but at the same time, that tournament itself, because the next day we beat West Virginia in double overtime. Had right? some pros on their team. Had some pros on their team. And yeah. then we come back the, the very next day on the third night and go to and, 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 um, and lose to Louisville, but we were up on them at halftime. Yeah. Sure. So we played six overtimes. We played two more overtimes to beat West Virginia the next day. And then we come back and we had the lead against Louisville. It was a, such a great Big East tournament as a whole. Obviously, it was a six overtime win. We ended up losing in the championship. But that memorable week and what you guys did, um, and I, I believe we just ran out of gas against Louisville because they pressed. They were really good as well. Pros, again, yeah, pros. They pros on their team too, right? So yeah. you talk about the ACC, the Big East, I thought was just as good or better than any conference that's ever been assembled at that time. Even when you go back to even Marquette being in the league with yeah. Wesley Matthews and those guys were pros on that team. So um, Jimmy Butler, I'm just thinking now, I'm thinking Marquette. Real McNeil. Yeah, McNeil. James. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like when you think about the Big East, but that tournament itself, though, he was my memorable time. And that one game of six overtime is my most memorable moment. Not, nothing can ever 
top the emotions of that and coming out on the winning side and, and really enjoying that. And it still is played on ESPN classics today during the tournament, like when it's or when it's rival week or something, they always play that game. And I can always see myself circling the, the wagons around the town out. I'm in the back talking to hop and I'm talking to guys as they're, as they're back hitting the floor. And Coach Bayham is continuing to motivate you guys in the huddle. Man, that was an unbelievable experience. I wish I could relive it today and replay it today. Hey, Murph, another one too, though, got to be freshman year. Got to be uh, that, that, that Big East tourney run. Ooh, um, yeah, that, that was incredible. You know why that was incredible? E, because we were, we were done. We weren't going to the tournament. We lost to the Paul by 50 over three, that last three game. weeks before that. That's exactly right. With Wilson Chandler, who should have been in an orange uniform. That's yeah. a whole other story because I blew it. And Will them <laughs> asked me to take him, right? That's one of the recruits that was hand delivered that come out of our program, Michigan Hurricanes, yeah. who Coach Bayham also liked, Hop also liked, but I was busy chasing higher rated recruits. Cause now, now I'm young at the time. You gotta remember now I want all the McDonald's. I'm like, well, my first recruit was Eric Devenfield. He was a McDonald's. <laughs> I can't disappoint. I want all McDonald's. So that was an oversight, but Wilson Chandler was on that team, but we lost, we didn't have a good year. Um, but when Jerry hit that shot against Cincinnati to propel us to the next game, and then he went on his tear and everybody just kind of rallied around him and we collectively got it done together. That was, that was a hell of a, a hell of a run. And then the the famous Coach Bayhan press conference. Ten freaking games, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And then he went into that. But uh that was an unbelievable run. You're right. That 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 is right there with the six overtime and big east tournament for me, but it just doesn't top that six overtime game. But Jerry McNamara and, and that team your freshman year, we did make a hell of a run to get in the tournament. And I remember losing to Texas AM uh with AC Law. And those Joseph guys. Jones. Yeah, Joseph Jones. Yeah, I, re I remember that game. And yeah, it, it was tough. I don't know if we ran out of gas or what the situation was, but we just couldn't get it done. They outplayed us that day. But still a memorable season because we could have just folded the tent. Yeah. And it could have been over. But we went down to New York. But, you know, we own New York. That's how I used to look at it. Like, no matter what happens, when we go to Madison Square Garden, we run that. So we're going to go down here and compete. And we coming down here to win a Big East championship. Nothing else matters before the Big East tournament starts. That's over. We would have the uh, the banquet on Sunday, our, our the famous Syracuse banquet. The Harwood, yeah. Yeah, the Harwood banquet. And then we would talk about the season and relive it. It's over. Let's go down to New York and do what we do. So, yeah, the Big East tournament was always great then, too. It was just all those memorable times just going down to Madison Square Garden and you know, playing in the game days, whether it was Georgetown or Villanova at home when it was 33, 34,000 in the building. Uh, just just having some like unbelievable times and memories. Um, I still got the picture in my office of when we beat Georgetown with like 33,000 there, you hit the shot and you running off the court and I grab you. I still got that picture where they captured it. I was like so excited and so happy and you came through it. Man, it's just fun times, man. You can't relive them, but it's good that we all had these great memories from a great experience. And I always say, like, well, even now what's going on in Syracuse, I'm always, you know, praying and hoping that they get better and they push themselves. So it was good to see them win the other day. But for us to be in a such a unique situation, right? You know, Coach Beheim has a unique name. He comes from a unique place in Lyons, New York. And Syracuse itself is a unique city. It's just like without Syracuse basketball, it wouldn't be what it is, right? So for all these unique situations, for us to actually have this experience to go there uh, and have so much success, build so many relationships and friendships, um, it's, it's nothing like it. And we talk about Orange, Orange Nation, so we talk about the program, right? But I believe like the relationships you build there is important, whether it's like in the community, the community businesses like Mike Rubenstein at Manny's or Dave Shearoff at the Mattress Place or Giovanna McCarthy over at Paparazzi Day Spa or uh, the media with Mike Waters and Donna DeTota. Um, you know, so all of those relationships and people you cross paths with, you get a chance to meet um, and you grow those relationships while you're there. But more importantly, you can reach back and they're still there for you. So I just love it. It's a unique place and I always have a special place in my heart. 
So you talk about all the relationships you build and, and the impact the Syracuse community had on you. You spent seven years there. You know, you're damn near 10 years as assistant uh, head coach altogether. Now you go to Eastern Michigan, you, you finally get the opportunity to run your own program, you know, be the head coach of a program and, uh, you know, you take the lead. What's that feel like when, you know, when you take that, take that head coaching job over? Well, it felt great, E, because it was an accomplishment. It's, it's very, very difficult to become a head coach, a Division One head coach. It's 320 jobs. Uh, and they're very difficult to come by. Um, so I was extremely excited to become a Division One head coach. But more importantly, I was able to go back close to home and do it where I had my family and I had a lot of relationships. So just to become that head coach was an unbelievable experience, I thought. Uh, during my time as a high school head coach at Kent State working for Jim Christian, at Syracuse working for Jim Beheim, everything I learned um, from those, those in particular situations and surrounding situations that I was able uh, to learn from, I was prepared to take the opportunity, right? It was time after seven years, was a part of a lot of winning. I had learned from a Hall of Fame coach and all the experiences. So I took everything that I had learned over a, probably an 18, 17, 18 year span at that point and put it into Eastern Michigan basketball. Um, so mainly um, just making sure, and you know, I learned from Coach Behan. One thing he told me, and this was in that 45 minute conversation we were talking when I came to his office. He said, the most important things to be successful as a head coach, no matter what anybody tells you, never forget this, is scheduling, and recruiting, recruiting and scheduling. You gotta have players to win. You have to have a really, really good schedule to make sure you're successful year in and year out. So people would always say, well, Syracuse never leaves the state of New York. Man, that was genius. That's why he's been able to <laughs> last for, for 46 years coaching, right? That was genius. A lot of people probably should have adopted that method and made sure they played as many home games as they could to give themselves an advantage to win, right? So I made sure that I, I took that into account. I took that into account to make sure I really recruited well. I made sure I scheduled well, uh, but more importantly, hiring, hiring out your first staff is important. Making sure you have some guys that were um, first and foremost, hard workers, very loyal. Some folks that were always gonna be honest with you. And that was gonna understand how important it was for me to make sure to see this program through to be successful. Uh, so taking on the program, I mean, after 10 years, leaving as the second all-time winning this coach uh, behind Ben Bryan, uh, and did that within, in, with, with a, a one less year and then a Kobe year. So it was really, really tough, but had a really, really great uh, run, uh, had some great players. We graduated 92% of our student athletes in the 10 year span I was here. We were 32 or 34. There's two guys right now, Willie Mangum and Ray Lee, that I'm still trying to get back and go and get their degrees. They're only probably like six credits short. Um, so understanding at that level that guys weren't going to go pro, but making sure that you mentor and make sure that you help them understand how important the academic side of and getting their degrees and while trying to win a MAC championship at the same time. So we had a lot of success uh, during my time at Eastern Michigan. Uh, I'm glad I I kind of took that job and bet on myself. And I tell people all the time, sit and be an assistant coach at a high major or a great coach as long as he's there, right? But at some point, you got to bet on yourself, right? And even talking with Coach Beheim, I remember him asking me, you know, Rob, is that a good job? Can you win there or can you get to your next job or can you be successful there? Uh, it's not proven that coaches go there win and move on to get to a higher level. Um, so we had those talks and everything he told me really made sense, but it came down to me as I wanted to bet on myself. I believed in myself. I believe I had put in the work over uh, uh, two decades to put myself in position to really, really um, take this opportunity. Uh, and because of those opportunities and because of great hires and because of the players I was able to recruit, I was able to have success over a 10 year span. And, something I'm really, you know, proud of and, and, and glad I was able to do. So, I mean, you check all these goals, man, like, you know, winning state championships, starting back in high school, you know, winning state championships, assistant coach, division one level, then you go to a higher level, then you become, 
you know, a head coach, 10 years at, at one program, which which is unheard. We talked about Coach Behind 46. That's that's never gonna happen again. But even 10 years, like like that doesn't happen. You know what I mean? And now, you know, we talk about your, you know, in your role with the Pistons, uh, president, general manager, Motor City Cruise, senior director of player personnel in your hometown, where are you from? You know, talking about, you know, growing up, going through all the struggles. What's that like, man? Because it's, it's full circle now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everything back full circle. You in that in that power position for the Detroit Pistons in your hometown. Talk yeah, about it's, that. it's actually unbelievable. And just going back to Eastern Michigan, short for, for one second, to last 10 years is one thing, E, but to work for three presidents and four athletic directors in a 10-year span is really tough. And you're still might be around, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, you're always auditioning for your job every year because everybody wants to hire their coach. That's how athletic directors move on. Programs win, they make great hires, prove they can make great hires. Programs win and they move on. So for me, being in an under-resourced program, taking it over, being the worst program in the MAC conference and getting it to the top uh, without many resources and having to play buy games and raise money and all of those things, um, you know, made it tough at times, but when you continue to fight, scratch, and claw, and and always believe in what you're doing, you you somehow figure out how to be successful. So that that stint for those ten years wasn't ideal, but the things that I had to overcome gave me the strength to become a better head coach in each and every year to have a success. And then you talk about things coming full circle. I thought it came full circle when I you know, was hired at Eastern Michigan. But to, you know, be hired as the president and general manager of the Motor City Crews and be promoted within 60 days to senior director and player personnel for the Pistons is a true blessing. Um, growing up here, obviously coming up during the bad boy area era with uh, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, Bill Lambeer, um, Dennis Rodman and all of those guys and, and, and really embracing and, and, and understanding what the bad boys were about, uh, how, it was how they were relatable to the city of Detroit and what it meant for us while I was here. Uh, the first basketball player I ever watched and ever liked was Kelly Topuka. People don't even know who that is, but he was a piston <laughs> player. And he was a shooter, a scorer, right? Sure. White guy who could really score the ball. And he was there before Isaiah Thomas. So I can remember those days growing up watching the Pistons at Cobo Hall or the Silver Dome when they had to play there. And that was before the Palace days. Cobo Hall. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it is. They're unbelievable, right? So that goes back to when I was a child watching the Pistons. So for it to become full circle, and I'm working from a home, home, hometown team that I grew up in, it's, it's almost not real for me. Like it's, it's like I thought Syracuse was the end-all, be-all. I thought Eastern Michigan was the end all be all. And now I'm like, God, what else, what else do you have for me? Because this is like unbelievable to me. Um, but I'm very fortunate, very thankful. Again, Troy Weaver, I talked about the story about the Syracuse and how that happened. But for him to be here in my hometown, and that's just how, how it's all worked out. Me have a great relationship with him over 20 years. He being one of my mentors. Um, and you talk about building relationships. So I never knew I would work for Troy or with Troy Weaver. Um, but over the last 20 years after I got to Syracuse or whether I was at Eastern Michigan, he was somebody that I spoke with probably every other week, whether it was about family, uh, whether it was about NBA basketball, college basketball, high school basketball, um, just what the next steps in his career look like, what the next steps in my career look like. So for him to be hired here, I knew it would be an opportunity but never believing or thinking that I would come in at such a high level. So I really thank him and Aaron Tellum for believing in me and to be becoming the president and general manager of our, our G League team. Um, so when you talk president, that's business side. E. So overseeing partnerships and sponsorships, ticket sales, whether it's group or single seasons, overseeing the PR and, and CR departments, um, branding and marketing and social media, um, soliciting new pops, new sponsorships for next year and the years beyond. So I oversee the business side, but the general manager's position is the all basketball. So that was hiring out a head coach and his staff, strength and conditioning and medical, um, making sure we're signing our G League roster, picking our affiliate players, um, putting in position our two-way guys uh, from the draft, 
and then our assignment guys who are our young guys that we're trying to develop for the Pistons. And then being promoted to senior director of player personnel where you oversee all their college and pro. So I'm preparing our staff for the NBA draft. Um, and I have to know the top 80 players uh, in basketball when you're talking college and international. So the top 60 players in college and then the top 20 international players, we have to know them in depth. Uh, you talk about evaluation and the intel part of it, all the background reports and checking the boxes there. And then understanding that and then having to understand and trade scenarios who will fit in on our Piston roster, uh, what trade may make sense, how will the money work, uh, what type of you know, uh, you know, person this may be we're bringing into our organization. So understanding all, the le all of these aspects of, of basketball from business, G League business, G League basketball, and NBA basketball. So I got really three roles. Um, it's a lot of work, but I'm really fortunate that Troy and Arn have belief in me that I can do the job effectively. So that I've taken over the job, I just have my head down and I've been working. And while we're going through this restoration process, making sure I'm all, you know, hands on deck in any area that we need to be successful. So I'm really excited about it. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it. Like you don't, you don't really, I haven't really enjoyed it in the moment because I've always been working. But now in my position, I kind of take a step back because I'm not coaching and I'm not preparing for a game every day and I'm not watching film every single day to prepare to win a game, but more so I'm working, but I'm able to maybe go to a game and see family or see our team play and I can sit back and just evaluate some and kind of soak up the atmosphere and soak up the moment and understand I'm in my hometown uh, from where I come from, Brewster Projects, to working for the Detroit Pistons with all I've had to endure, all the obstacles um, and challenges that I've faced, but understanding all the beauty and opportunity that I've awarded and I've been able to, mm -hmm. to grow from. Uh, going back and crediting my high school coach for giving me the vision <clears throat> and direction, because that's extremely important. Um, but I tell all the young people, um, you know, passion, desire, and belief means so much. Because if you find something you love, like I love the game of basketball, even I was better in football and it was other things that I could have could have done in my life, but I fell in love with basketball. So that was my passion. So the passion and that that I have for basketball is first. And then the desire to want to be great. Like no matter how good of a player I was, I still wanted to be great. I worked extremely hard and I took every measure uh, that I could take to be better as a player. And I took that same approach when I graduated from college, when I started as a high school coach on the Kent, Syracuse and Eastern Michigan, I did everything in my power to be great. I had the desire to be great. And then just the belief uh, in, in just believing in yourself. Like we have so much self doubt. Um, and I tell people, I'm not supposed to be here, right? Um, I had the angels come help me and give me opportunity, whoever God sent me in my life. But at no point did I ever not believe that I can accomplish the things that I've accomplished. So with passion, desire, and belief, if you can put those three things together and start with the vision and direction, taking those next steps to do what you need to do, it's a great chance you can be successful. Like that's, that's kind of been my motto my whole life, vision and direction, passion, desire, and belief. Those five things will help anyone become successful. And when things start to like waver and not go your way, and you know, you may have some doubt here or there, you gotta believe, you, you gotta believe. And it's no different than how you are and how you were as a player. You always thought and believed you were the best player. Like, I don't care who we was playing. I don't care who we, we, we were recruiting. I don't, you thought you was better. You'd be like, I don't give a, I, I can do, I, I, it, it was all about E. Like, what nobody better than you? Right. But that that's why you were a great player. Right. Because you put in the work. Right. I would watch you even at Syracuse. Like you would work with the guards, but you would come in early, perfect your craft, stay late, perfect your craft, get in the game. You didn't you want the big moment. You want the big shot. You like, no, come to me. I, I want that. This, this I want. This is me. This is my time. 
right? Yeah. But you believed it, right? You were passionate about it and you had the desire to be great. If you didn't have a passion for basketball, the desire to be the best player and the belief that you could, you wouldn't have been a McDonald's All-American. You just, it wouldn't have happened for you, right? There's so many talented people that get lost in translation or lost in the system or lost. But when you have those qualities about yourself, more times than not, you're gonna be successful. And then Will and your parents gave you the vision and the direction, whether you was in uh, Bay City, whether it was going to Oak Hill, okay, here's a recruitment process. We got Florida, we got Michigan State, we got Syracuse. Yeah. No, we're going we gonna, we gonna to direct you here. This is what we're going to do, and we're going to make sure. And now basketball – It was damn near Florida. Florida. Yeah, I know. It was there. It was done because <laughs> Roman went there. I remember. No, I remember that. And so for you to – even after basketball, you're still doing the TVT thing, which is great. But what you've been able to do in life, like taking your passion elsewhere to help others, right? And believing and understanding that others need help. And now it's no longer about Eric Devendorf, the basketball player. It's like, how can I impact the community? How can I impact the youth? How can I give something back? Because everybody gave something to me, right? And I don't know at what point, what clicked for you, because it was all about basketball and all about you. But what, I guess I should ask you, at what time did it click for you to start thinking about these different things from the community and giving back? I think really the first, when it really clicked is when I had my first daughter. You know, really, because that was like really like, all right, now it's, it's, it's somebody like more important to myself. You know what I'm saying? You know, my parents, obviously, but like my responsibility, you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, going through those, you know, trial and errors, and then just, you know, going through that journey, I, I really started to like, all right, yeah, like it, it's way better when you're helping other people out along the way. You First of all, you learn more about yourself and who you really are, yeah. you know, and then you're not as alone. You know what I'm saying? Like other people want to want to be around, you know, in college, I was like, like, you're right. I was just selfish, like ego, you the man. Like I, I remember one particular one, Murph, where because we, we used to get into it because we could, because we had that type of. We had yeah, that type sure. of relationship. Yeah, you know no, what no. I mean? It was, it was against UConn. We played at UConn. <laughs> you already know. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't have a good game. You know, and we get back on the bus. And, <laughs> you know, I'm in, my, I'm, in the, I'm in my window seat. I ain't trying to hear nothing. You know what I mean? But I, yeah. You, you, you come back down there. You come back yeah. there with yeah. the stat sheet. <laughs> Yeah. You got the stat sheet. You all in yeah. my face. Like, yeah, I've been looking at it. I, I just want to tell you a couple of things. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you put it in my face. I'm like, man, fuck that. I'm not trying to hear yeah. that shit right now, Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, nah, I need you to see this. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is what, this is yeah. why you was out the game. This is yeah. why you was playing. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So, yeah. so like right then and there, like you, like it's those type of moments, man, that, that you yeah. that you look back on and you kind of figure out like, hot damn, what the fuck was I on? Like. Yeah, you know, we and I, I remember that because it's the here's the thing, it started in the locker room because coach said something to you. You was like, I don't want to hear it out. And I'm looking, I'm like, you're like, I don't want to hear blah 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 blah. So coach <laughs> was like, okay, he walked away. So I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, we just lost. He didn't play well. Right. This is on E. Like he mad at coach. So when I looked at the stat sheet, I'm like, uh. Yeah, I got I got to tell. I remember approaching you nice. <laughs> like, hey, man, listen, man, let me holler at you because you just said some things to coach, and this ain't on coach. Like, I, I had to have his back that day. And when you you said exactly what you said, and we got the – oh, man, that, I remember coach coming in the next morning. was like, well, what happened on the bus? I said, coach, like, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. He was mad at you. But it was really he played bad. So I right. just went to talk to him and he blew up on me. So then I blew up. And then everybody had to grab me and grab you. That was crazy, <laughs> man. But there are those moments where you look back, right? It's been plenty of those times with different people, but you learn from them and you grow from them. But it was my job at that time. Like I couldn't sit there, although I may have should have waited till the next day because you were really frustrated in the locker room. But I'm like, no, I got to try to show E because I got to help him grow in this moment because this wasn't on coach. This is on him, man. He 
like I got every, I like, I always had the players back. Like I'm like, no, nah, coach, you, you, I, I get what you're saying, but let me tell you what they thinking. This particular moment, it was all on you. And you didn't want to have no parts of hearing nothing. But <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's a true story. We got on that bus, we ended up flying back and, you know, but, but everybody wanted to win too. Like you were probably thinking selfish at the time, but ultimately you wanted to play well because you wanted to win and you want to put yourself in position to get to the NBA. Coach want to win, win the Big East. I want to win the Big East. So we all had the same common goals. It was just sometime it came out in the frustrations of emotions, but it's all love. Like we all care for each other. We all love each other. And it's, it's been a great ride. It really has. And, and that kind of takes me to uh, you know, the last question, Murph, mm -hmm. about this year's team. What I always say, like, that's what, that's what really – these guys are missing, right? You, you'll never see that from a guy on that team. To, to not say, I don't know the relationship and dynamic between the coaches, but like you said, like you need that, you need guys who have that fire, and have that passion. In, in practice, even in practice, Murph, like me and Johnny was, we was getting in fight, like right here, Always. like hop. Like this, this team this year doesn't have, they have good players, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it, it's, it's, you can feel like something missing. What, I mean, what's your take on this year's team? What, what are you seeing? You know, from, from me, I, I think we've always had a team that was, no matter how many points we score, we were always in position to be successful on the defensive side of the ball. Going back to the beginning of our conversation, that was my most important uh, aspect is me enhancing the zone and Coach Bayheim allowing me to put in closing bump drills from the top, from the side, trap rotations and do different things with the forwards and the centers. Um, I just don't see the defensive tenacity and the defensive passion that we need. So even a guy like yourself, you were a great scorer, but we always had a guy like Arenze Anuaku who was going really like hold down the middle. Or we always had a dirty guy like Rick Jackson that was going to do everything he could, whether he was scoring or not, or whoever those forwards would be, or sometimes we would have bigger guards. I just think when, when I look at this right now, it's the lack of defense, intensity, intensity, and tenacity. Like they have guys who can put the ball in the in the basket, but you got to be able to get stops, right? And if you don't get enough stops and accumulate enough stops during the game, it's very hard to win. And when you play in defense, like teams will come in. I would always ask my staff, what are these teams coming in averaging in transition? That would be my biggest thing. And how many transition points are they giving up? So for me, I had something called a three-second drill. Well, we had to get back. We were cutting out your transition points. So if you came in averaging 18 points in transition, you may end up with four. So that's 14 points you was going to take off your average, right? And then defensively, whatever you were shooting from three, it was going to be a lower percentage. And anything that came inside, we was going to block your shot, alter your shot, or we was going to trap the short corner to make sure we were getting deflections because deflections lead to steals. Steals, steals lead to easy offense. So for me, it just boils back to when I'm watching Syracuse this year, it's just not a lot of energy on defense because I think they have enough to put points on the board. Like Buddy is really good. Like he has a chance to play at the next level. I think he's a really good player, can really shoot it, can do it off the dribble. And I think they have a host of guys who can put enough points on the board. But if, you're not playing defense at a high level and rebounding the back uh, the backboard. It's always going to be tough. So you gotta you gotta defend and you gotta dominate the backboard. The game is one on the glass. If you can get a guy to miss and you get that thing with two hands, either get it out in transition or walk it up and get something good on offense, you're always going to have a chance to put yourself in position to win a basketball game. But you gotta defend and you gotta dominate the backboard. The teams that we had that were good at Syracuse, if you go back and look at the defensive numbers that nobody talk about, they were really, really good. All them Sweet 16 teams and different teams we had, like we were really, really good defensively. But it was just never talked about because we are an offensive program. But you got to play defense. That's my biggest thing, and I think that's what's, that's what's lacking. So I don't know if that can change overnight. Um, but – you know, you got to be good on defense. You got to be that. That's my that's my take on it. That's what I think. All right, man. I lied. I lied. Last last question. No, you good. <laughs> so all the you know all the basketball accomplishments. You know, you checking off all the goals as far as that goes. 
But I think two of the things that you, you're probably most proud of is your foundation that you started, you know, the Robin Murphy Foundation, and also the book that you wrote deep talking about talking about your life. So kind of talk about those two things and, and what really made you want to do those. Well, well, the first thing ultimately I'm proud of, you mentioned it on your end too, is being able to have my two children, right? Yeah. RJ and Ryan. It's not not a bigger blessing or two blessings in the world than to have them to, to, to be their father and in their lives and watch them continue to grow. Son, RJ being in ninth grade now, 14 years old, and my daughter, um, you know, being 12 years old and uh, being in sixth grade right now. Like it's it's a blessing how far they've come from babies to now and how much knowledge they've gained and continuing to grow and be in competitive sports and be competitive academically and be doing really, really well. So that's first and foremost, like the most important accomplishment that I've been able, been able to experience and, going, and, and with God's will, will continue to experience. And then, you know, with my foundation, because of my upbringing, um, and I remember being at Syracuse, you know, you know coach the Jim and Julie Bayheim Foundation, and I would watch all the money that they were raised for different um, things in that area and giving back. So I said, when I became a head coach, and fortunately for me, it was in close to home, I would start my own foundation. So I went back to my neighborhood where I grew up, um, where there's a lot of struggle and a lot of kids without. And my whole goal was to be able to start there at the pilot school of Bagley and throughout that community and just make sure kids were able to have experiences that they weren't having. So we have our gift to sharing event that we do every Christmas. We have the reading challenge um, the first through the fourth graders, right? Just to encourage the literacy part of it to make sure they're reading. Um, and then we built computer labs because uh, I think the technology needs are most important. Um, but some schools in, in Detroit here, they don't have any technology. Like they don't have the computer, the iPad, the laptop. So to just be able to, to give back um, throughout the year to these different schools and underprivileged kids are great. So I'm very proud of that. And then writing my book was the second phase of my foundation, just making sure I share my story um, to make people know and understand and maybe learn that your obstacles or challenges do not have to dictate your outcome. That's the biggest message is just, again, going back to the vision and direction, passion, desire, belief. I talk about it in every chapter in every phase of my book. Um, and I've been able to really share it with a lot of colleges. I've been on a lot of speaking uh, engagements and talking about it from whether it's real estate companies to professional teams and to different colleges as well. So it's done really, really well and it's making an impact. And it's just something I'm proud of because writing a book was therapeutic for me. I never had the opportunity to really go sit down in front of a counselor and talk about what I went through at a young age or throughout my career. Cause now my head is down, I have tunnel vision and my whole goal is how do I become successful to never go back where I came from? But I left everything back where I came from inside. So to be able to write the book and it take, it took me like probably, probably four to four and a half years to get it all out because it was really tough in the beginning. But once I was able to get it out, I felt a lot better that I could talk about my story and tell my story. I remember, remember for years, never ever sharing with anybody what happened to my mom. I was embarrassed. Um, I couldn't say it. I didn't want to relive it. But I got to a point in my life where I was mentoring all these kids and then mentoring the, and coaching at the college level. And I'm like, you know what? I got a story to tell. I got something that I can share with everybody that if I can come from this and now I have president next to my name, like you can do it too. Like, and I always tell my son and my daughter is as great as I've been doing because they read a lot about me or they may see how people approach me, I tell them, you guys are going to be a million times better than I could ever be, right? You guys are much better than your dad could ever be. You're way ahead of the game. You have things that I've never had. Like, you just have to, like, have some stick to it this, understand the importance of every step of life and, and never rushing to get somewhere, but always working hard to get to the next place. So um, that's kind of it. E, I'm, I'm really proud of those two things. I'm glad you mentioned them. Um, and just like you, continuing to give back is important. I get a joy out of sharing. I have empathy for people in every situation that I come across. I'm very compassionate about people and what I do. 
And if I can share and give and love and care, that's the side of people that people really don't know because I'm always working, but I'm always willing to help and give. Um, and I think that's the biggest gift and why I keep continuing to be get blessings, right? Because I give so much and I've given throughout my life and I'm extremely thankful for every stop and every person that I've touched and that have touched me. I'm very thankful for it. Yo, Murph, man, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I know yeah. whoever listens to this podcast is going to soak up a whole lot of game because you was just giving them out like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, dang, just yeah, diving I, it out. Yeah, like, I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Anytime you guys are doing something, man, and you need me, um, when I'm in town, I make sure we communicate a little bit more because when you're having something, I'd love to come out to you guys' events if you're talking to kids, speaking to kids. Uh, but whatever you need from me, you know I'm always here. Anything I can do to help, let me know. I appreciate you inviting me on. I told you I've been watching your part, listening to your podcast. I've been watching uh, you and Chris Joe do your thing. And I'm like, they're my guys. Like, I got to get down with them. They're my guys. So anything you need, let me know, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Mark. We're going to do it again. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Anita.